you so much for coming out tonight. I want to thank the Bedford Library, and I want to thank Mary Ann Sinatra for allowing me to give this presentation that I hope you will find very interesting. I, uh, this is about emotional eating, and we're, we don't have all that much time, but I will do my best to cover as much information as possible. Uh, the last half hour, we will open it up to questions. So I would like you to all save your questions till that, till that point, okay? Now, this, I call this food for the soul, and it's about emotional eating. So what exactly is emotional eating? Basically, it's eating when you're not hungry. Because if you were hungry, you could grab a carrot stick and it would satisfy you. But that's not usually what you're grabbing, is it? It's not a carrot stick. It's usually cookies, cakes, candies, and ice cream. And when I talk about overeating, by the way, you can have sweets and sugar. But the problem is when you overeat those sweets and sugar. And we'll find out more and more as we go along. And by the way, when you look at me, kind of thin hair, let me tell you, I've had my own problems with emotional eating, um, especially as a kid. And this is what I can sum it up, what I remember in my head. Fat and skinny had a race all around the pillowcase. Fat fell down and broke her crown, and skinny won the race. I heard that over and over and over again. So believe me. You usually teach what you need to learn. Um, so emotional eating is when a person uses food in order to cope with physiological and psychological stress. 70, they feel that 75 to 80 percent of overeating is due to emotional eating. Now, stress, as we all know, is a normal part of life. But too much stress or stress that is left imbalanced can lead to a wide variety of symptoms. Stress can lead to backaches, migraines, depression, anxiety, insomnia, and in order to get relief, we often, we often reach for something for comfort. Some people will indulge in excessive drinking or smoking to get relief from stress. We're talking about emotional stress, psychological, and physiological stress. And some of us, like myself, will reach for food to comfort us from what happens when too much stress attacks our body and our mind. So we reach for these unhealthy life choices for food to find relief. What happens is, whatever it is you choose, it often becomes your drug of choice. Now, diets are very hard. They say in the United States we have over 35,000 diets. So for myself, I have been on, especially as a young kid, the protein diet where I drank, along with my mother, liquid protein. Did anybody here, Bridget, anybody do that diet? Yeah. And then there's the Slim Fast. How many on that? I did it. Yeah, Slim Fast diet. Then we have uh, Dr. Atkins. How many on that? Right. And the list goes up. The grapefruit diet. Anybody on the grapefruit diet? Oh, yeah. So think about how much money that you have spent on these diets. Think of how many pounds you lost and how many pounds you gained. Now, here comes another one. How many of you went out and bought exercise equipment? <laughs> yeah. And where is that exercise equipment right now? 
either in the yard sale years, years ago or it's a, like a plant or something somewhere. Now, to show you how, how I suffered from this myself, uh, being overweight, and I remember years ago after my first son was born, I bought, I don't think any one of you ever had this in your home, I bought one of these machines that had a motor here and a strap. It, it, and you put it on and it goes, and meanwhile, I'm eating. It didn't work. Now, of all the, the most ridiculous thing I ever bought to lose weight, I don't, I've never seen it again in a magazine, but you send away for it, you're supposed to blow it up and wear it, and then clean your house in the nude, <laughs> and you will sweat the pounds off. Well, I ordered it, and it came in the mail. And it came in a box about this big, this thin, this big. I opened it up, it took forever. It was made of plastic, and you kept opening and opening it. Now, it's plastic, and it said it came with an automatic blower to blow it up. And you, you put it on for leggings, goes all the way up for a leg here, all the way up here, and then it comes up to here. And it's all sticky because it's made out of plastic. And then here's the automatic blowing thing in, in that blows it up. You put it here, it's a straw. <laughs> and you go like this. <laughs> <laughs> By the time you're through, you know, you're, you're so out of it. Now, you got it all blown up. And now you're supposed to take the vacuum cleaner <laughs> and sweat. And then you would hit a piece of furniture, pss, pss, and all the little pop holes. And I did the diet pills with my mother, and we cleaned the house wonderfully, and we lost weight, and then we gained it all back. So I tell you, there are so many diets out there. Diets don't work. Now, this is a different approach. This is about the mind-body connection, how to lose weight. It's not changing your diet so much as changing your thinking. So we're going to make it simplistic and show you that we have a subconscious mind and a conscious mind. Now, I'm a hypnotherapist. This is not about hypnosis. However, it is about your subconscious mind, which hypnosis does deal with. So the subconscious mind, you must have heard the thing where we only use about 10% of our minds. Well, that's true. We use 10% of the conscious mind. What does the conscious mind do? It thinks and it plans. It's rational, it's analytical, it's your willpower and temporary memory. Okay, now let's look at the other side. The subconscious mind, which is where all your beliefs are, all your learned beliefs. Um, if I steal, I'll go to hell. That's, that's a belief, strong beliefs. And you learn these beliefs when you're a child, for the most part. So your subconscious mind involves your autonomic nervous system. Some people call it the automatic nervous system. It's your autonomic nervous system, and it controls the physiological changes that occur in your body. They occur in your subconscious mind. For instance, my heart rate, my, my pulse. I don't have to think about making my heart run, do I? No, it's subconscious. The subconscious does that. I don't have to, I don't have to think about breathing, do I? Otherwise, I'd be going, oh, inhale, time for an exhale, inhale. My subconscious mind does that. I don't have to think about walking. My subconscious mind does that for me. So all your autonomic nervous system, the subconscious mind is in charge of. The stress response is in charge. What is in charge? Your subconscious mind is in charge of your stress response. We'll get to that. All learned behaviors are stored in the subconscious mind. Everything you've learned is stored in the subconscious mind. 
So let's show you how this works. In a moment, I'm going to count from one to three. When I say the number three, I want you all to repeat the alphabet because I'm sure you all learned the alphabet. You ready? Out loud. It's like Sesame Street here. One, two, three, A. B, C, D, E, F. Uh, you have to go on. I know you learned that. And you learned it very well. It's stored in the subconscious. Now, I want you on the count of three to repeat the alphabet. This time, I want you to repeat the alphabet every third letter. A, B, C, K. Ready? Every third letter. One, two, three, A. A <laughs> wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, something's wrong here. What's wrong is you learned A, B, C, D, E, F, G. When I ask you to learn something new, you can't do it. Because you have to do what? Think about it. You have to think about it. Once you have to think about it, if you do something over and over and over again, you don't have to think about it. It becomes automatic. Once you start changing your eating behaviors, at first, it's very, very difficult. For instance, I want to show you just how difficult it is. Take your hands, go like that. You will have automatically put either the, you would automatically have put the, uh, right here, I have the left thumb over my right thumb. Okay? Now, and so on, each finger. Now, I want you to change it so that I now have my right thumb over my left. How does that feel? It's really, it's strange, isn't it? It doesn't feel natural. When you begin to learn to eat correctly or a healthy diet, it's very difficult because you are changing the neural pathways in your brain. Everything you learn is in your brain. It's a neural pathway in your brain. It's something you must do when you go and begin to eat correctly. The more you do it right, when I say right, when you do about 80% of your eating is healthy, then you have changed your neural pathway in your brain. Now you cannot unlearn something. That old pathway will always be there. But you can relearn something which will then be on top of the old neural pathway. And it is what you will then do. You are more apt to reach for an apple than you are a donut once you change this neural pathway. So all learned behaviors. The subconscious doesn't know the difference between reality, what is uh, imagined, uh, reality, excuse me, what is, uh, and re uh, imagination. The subconscious mind doesn't know the difference between reality, what is real, and imagination. Now this is very important because it has to do with your self-talk, commercials, and the food industry. Now I'm going to ask you this. How many of you saw the movie Psycho? Raise your hand. Okay. After you saw the movie Psycho, and it was the first time that you were taking a shower, <laughs> did you happen to check, number one, that the door was locked? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you kind of went like this with the shower curtain? <laughs> How many? Raise your hand. Anybody do that kind of like? Kind of just in case after you saw Psycho. But you did lock the door, and you were sure you locked the door. All right. How many of you saw the movie Jaws? Raise your hand. OK. After you saw Jaws, the first, I say Jaws because I'm from Long Island, so it's Jaws, Jaws. After you saw the movie, and it was your first time, and you went to the ocean to go into the water, did you just happen to? Look around for dun 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 dun. I had a man come to see me, and this is the truth. Imagination is stronger than reality. He owned, he bought a lake house. He couldn't get in the lake. He was afraid there'd be sharks. Sounds crazy. Reality? He knew there was no sharks in a lake. 
but subconsciously, the subconscious is very protective. It was keeping him from going into the lake. Planes, phobias, people who can't leave their house. Is that real? Does that make sense? No. They learned a certain behavior and it gets stuck in their subconscious mind. It becomes their belief and they can't get out. They're stuck. So, and we're going to talk about commercials and your self-talk and the food industry when it comes to reality, excuse me, imagination and willpower. And by the way, willpower, right? Conscious mind? Imagination? Subconscious mind? I want you all to use as much willpower right now and please do not think of a polka dot pink elephant. Go ahead. Don't, don't, don't do it, please. Use all the willpower you can. Don't think of a polka dot pink elephant. You see, imagination is stronger. So, before I even get into the stress, I'm going to explain something else about imagination being stronger. A lot of people are afraid of hypnosis. Oh, I can't be hypnotized. As a matter of fact, how many people here think they can't be hypnosis? This is not about hypnosis, but I want to show you something. How many people here think they can't be hypnotized? Raise your hand. Well, actually, you're hypnotized all day long. It's a natural, normal state of mind. And it's just a state, for instance, you ever read a book and you're so engrossed in the book, we're at the library, usually I say a movie, but we're at the library, I'll say a book. You're so engrossed in a book and somebody can call your name, you don't really even hear it. Exactly. You're right into it. You're right into that. You're absorbed. That's a hypnotic state. You ever drive home and can't remember how you got there? That's a hypnotic state, which driving in the car, by the way, is your subconscious mind. Because you learn to drive. You're an automatic. So when you're watching a commercial, now there's different ways of getting hypnotized, but you're, you're watching a commercial, you're watching TV. You're nice and what? Relaxed. relaxed. You're so relaxed. And in the beginning, most of these TV programs, especially the ones that have the specials, in the first few minutes, there aren't too many commercials. The commercials start to come towards the end, you know, they go, come like this. They know that you're not getting up now. You had your coffee, you're, you're nice and comfy and cozy. They know you're not getting, you're going to get up. So the commercials come like this. And they're the same commercials. And you turn to your husband, what? How, how many times have I seen this commercial? This is ridiculous. They don't care what your conscious mind thinks. They are implanting a suggestion to your subconscious mind. And they're doing it over and over. A, B, C, D. Come down to Macy's, come by me. A, B, C, D. They repeat it. And then what they also do is have, they have music, emotions. They're appealing to your imagination. And when they show the makeup and the hair, why don't they show some normal people? Because they want you to imagine that that's what's going to be you when you go out and buy those things. So you see, imagination is extremely strong or else, because these TV programs, the ads, are giving suggestions to you. They're fooling you. And it also comes with the food that they're food, fo fooling you. Since I'm on this topic, I will continue on this topic. You've just eat, eaten. You just had something to eat. You're full. You even had dessert. And you sit down right in front of the TV. You're watching it. And there's this commercial about Sara Lee chocolate cake. <clears throat> and they take the fork in slow motion. Slow motion. They cut the chocolate cake. Look how moist it is, and it just strings back. It's always somebody slim, too. Oh, and now you begin to salivate. Imagination. For instance, everybody close your eyes, please. Take a deep breath in. Exhale slowly. 
and relax. And I want you now to picture in your mind, imagine a beautiful yellow lemon. Yellow lemon. Such a beautiful yellow lemon. Pick that yellow lemon up. Smell it. Feel it. Feel the waxiness of that lemon. Feel the little bumps in that lemon, that beautiful yellow lemon. Now in front of you is a cutting board. I want you to cut that beautiful lemon into quarters. Oh, look at the burst of juice coming out of that lemon. Now take your knife and take all the little seeds. Get the seeds out of the lemon. Oh, the aroma, that fresh, clean aroma of lemon. All right, now there's a glass there. I want you to pick up one of the quarters of lemon. I want you to squeeze it in the glass. Mmm. Pick up another slice of lemon. Squeeze it in the glass. <coughs> now take that glass of lemon and juice. Bring it close up to your nose. Smell it. Look at it. Look at the cloudiness. The little cl now there are little pieces of pulp. The little pieces of pulp floating around. And now take that glass of lemon juice. I want you to bring it up to your lips now. Just kind of bring it up to your lips. Oh, you ready? Here we go. I want you to, I want you to take that lemon juice. I want you to shake a... You don't have to swallow it, but take a big gulp and shift it around your mouth. Oh, my goodness. Spit it out. Spit it out. Okay, spit it out. Open your eyes. How many of you salivated? Now, if I did that a little longer, because commercials are actually, that's an autonomic response. If I said to you, one, two, three, I salivate, you couldn't do it. Your imagination did it. And it's your imagination that gets you in trouble. Because when you look at food, you talk yourself into the food. Don't talk yourself into the food. You have to talk yourself out of the food. To the point if you have to make maggots on the damn thing. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth because look what they're doing in the food companies. They're making it look much more delicious than it ever is. It's incredible. You know the big pieces of pizza, you know, and you go to Papa Gino, look at it all, look at the pizza. Oh, and that ice cold glass of beer. Oh, it's perfect. Everything is perfect. And they give you that slice of pizza. It's nothing like that picture. They're using your imagination. And in order to fight it, you need to use your imagination. You need to use your imagination. I went into, um, that's when we lost electricity, when we had that storm uh, a while ago. I wouldn't use my laptop, so I went into Panera's and I went to get a cup of coffee and people are online and nothing against Panera. Once in a while, you, I think, to indulge is great. But I saw people, the foods that they had on that plate. Now, I look at it, and this is, I used to look at it and go, oh, I really want that. Doesn't that look good? Now I look at it and I said, oh. I break it apart. I see the fat. I see the sugar. I see the fat and I say, oh, that's Crisco. That's fat in the can. <laughs> I stay away from it. I don't make it look good. When they pick that thing up and they give it to somebody, look at all the grease. Look at all the grease. And that food doesn't. So what you do is you end up talking yourself out of it. Don't say, I want that. Say, I choose not to have that. It's a, a thought. See, I, I have these for, for slides, but I, I... A thought is not just a thought. It's a neural pathway in your brain. A thought becomes your imagination and then becomes your behavior. A thought becomes a behavior. A thought becomes an emotion. The emotion, the thought, the behavior. You want to change your thoughts, to change your emotions, to change your behavior. 
So we'll get on to that and let's go back to stress and maybe we'll sum it up with that. Stress and weight gain. Research has proven that stress hormone cortisol stimulates, stimulates an enzyme in fat cells which increases fat storage, especially around the middle. They also found that overweight individuals are much more responsive to stress. Now, type 1 stress. This is hardwired in our brains in order for our survival. Neanderthal man, Neanderthal woman. So our Neanderthal man and woman, in order for us to survive, when they saw something, and it usually what they saw was something life-threatening, they had to run from it or they had to fight it for survival. Stress hormones were secreted. The stress hormones that are secreted are adrenaline, get your heart rate up, get you going. Cortisol is released into your body from the adrenal glands. So cortisol releases glucose, sugar, and fatty acids into the bloodstream to produce tremendous amounts of energy. You gotta fight, you gotta run, you need a lot of energy. Blood sugar increases, all that sugar coming up and out to get those uh, muscles working, going. Blood pressure elevates. Muscles, same thing, muscle breaks down to be used uh, to make sugar for energy. Uh, insulin rises. Now you have all the sugar. You got all the sugar going around, so your insulin rises. And now with this, this is called the sympathetic nervous system. There's two, the nervous system for the most part is split in two, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Sympathetic nervous system has nothing to do with sympathy. <laughs> it's about activating all of this. The parasympathetic nervous system is to calm you down because our Neanderthal over here, after he fought or after he ran, he calms down. Just like an animal, you'll see an animal get, you know, whatever, and as soon as it's over, you know, cat fight, and then they're out, they're relaxed. But what's going on with us? Something different. We call that type one. We're not using the free floating sugar in our body for energy. We didn't run, we didn't fight. Now we have all this sugar. So insulin now tells the cells to redeposit all that sugar, that glucose. Excess glucose is stored now as fat. You took all the sugar out, you didn't run, you didn't fight, you didn't use it up. So you take it all out. Guess what happens if you don't have any sugar left? You get hungry. You get hungry. And what do you get hungry for? What do you usually get hungry for at 4 o'clock? What do you want? Sweets, sugar, high carbohydrates, or fats, usually both together. So stimulate your appetite. And result, weight gain or difficult losing unwanted pounds. Because all the uh, fatty uh, acids and sugar can't go back into the muscles. It goes back here into your abdomen. So chronic stress, the central fat cells found mainly deep in the abdomen, you have in your abdomen, it goes right, all the fat goes right here. Because in your abdomen, you have more receptor sites for cortisol. And also, if you're going to be in a state of famine, the easiest place to grab the fat which needs to be processed through the liver, is in the belly. So, chronic stress, ignoring the fun, and after a while, by the way, uh, insulin won't respond anymore, which leads to diabetes. And very high cholesterol. Now, that was type one stress. We don't deal with wrecks anymore. <laughs> So there's no wild beasts. In the course of our dearly lives, we're confronted with other things, other threats. We have bills. We have kids. We have lines. We have traffic. And it goes on and on the news. Now, these things aren't going to kill us. But 
<laughs> it's not so immediate. We're not going to die from them. But we hold the threats in our minds. They become worry. Worry is something that has not happened. Guilt is something that has happened and you can't do anything about. Worry is your imagination. You are now facing type 2 stress because you are going over this and over this and over this once again in your mind. You are causing the stress response. The brain now reacts to our thoughts, images, and fears. It reacts as if it were real. And you're constantly laying down more fat because of it because of your mind. In fact, when you're stressed while you're eating, in some ways, you're not metabolizing it at all. You're stressed, you're even laying down more fat to a certain extent. So what can you do? You can reverse the stress response. Here's one of the things that we'll go over today. You can reverse the stress response. One of the ways you can reverse this stress response is something called diaphragmatic breathing. It's so easy to do. Remember we said there was a sympathetic nervous system and a parasympathetic nervous system? All right, sympathetic. Go, baby, go, right, run, fight. Parasympathetic. <sighs> Relax. You're calm, comfortable, safe, and secure. You now are combating the cortisol that is in your body. I like to think of it as a bank account. When you have stress and you keep taking out of your bank account, there's nothing left. If you do some relaxation, you are putting a deposit in. Because if you don't put a deposit in, this is what happens. Elevated cortisol levels resulting from chronic stress have been associated with the following conditions. Increased body fat, decreased muscle tone. Anybody here ever have um, hyperthyroidism? All right, I've had hyperthyroidism. It's uh, metabolism, is so your body is constantly in a state of stress. You actually, your muscles hurt because they're constantly tensed, just like stress makes you tense and you begin to lose your muscle. Decreased muscle tone, decreased muscle mass, decreased bone density, increased anxiety, increased depression, and in fact, if you constantly have anxiety, worry, then anxiety, constant anxiety can lead to depression. Mood swings, reduced sex drive, impaired immune system, memory and learning impairment, increased symptoms of PMS, increased menopausal effects, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, high blood pressure, cholesterol, and increased cravings. And I'm watching the clock, so I'm sure we have some time left. Now, not only does you, do you have increased cortisol, but during stress, it also in, leads to lower serotonin levels. Lower serotonin. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter in the brain. Prozac, uh, antidepressants, they have, uh, they up for the most part, some are a little different, but for the most part, they up your serotonin levels. <coughs> serotonin is released after eating carbohydrates, sugar, and starches, and it enhances calmness. It enhances and improves your outlook. It lessens depression, right? So after you eat something, how do you feel? You feel good. You feel good. But, and it's it probably no coincidence that when you're stressed or blue, this is what you turn, turn to, candies, cakes, cookies, ice cream, sweets, etc., to help you out. However, stress and emotional eating is generally followed by guilt, self-punishment, and feeling bad. Well, you felt bad, and you grabbed the cookies, cake, and blah, 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 <laughs> and whatever. And you felt good for a little while, and then you went right back eating it again, and now you got a double whammy. You feel guilty. You feel, that, you know, self-judgment. Oh, I'm so stupid. 
keep saying that over and over again. Now, the food industry does something else. It's going to add to your stress. Stress causes increased appetite and food cravings, which leads us to reach for the nearest form of comfort. I know there's some chocolate down here somewhere. I, looking through the house for it all over the place. It's like where people who smoke. Where's my cigarette? Where's my cigarette? Tell me this is not a drug of, drug of choice. And by the way, when I say drug of choice, I want to tell you before I go on, and I wish I could tell you so much. I wish I could really do some workshops here, but chocolate, dark chocolate, 70% or higher is good for you. If you learn to eat it mindfully, and mindfulness eating is another whole subject that uh, at some point we maybe we can go over. But uh, a little bit of chocolate, dark chocolate, will actually help to a certain extent if you eat it mindfully to lower your cravings. If you eat it mindfully, you taste the chocolate and not go like this. You eat it slowly. So um, we're gonna we'll go to this. Learn behaviors, and we'll get on to the other topic in a minute. Learn behaviors. Remember A B C D F G. You learned it. Okay. How many people here, when they were young, did their parents reward them with sweets? Raise your hand. Ah, you learned that. Little girl falls down, little boy falls, oh, don't cry, here's a, here's a cookie. Here's a, you feel bad, here's a cookie. You come home from work, oh, I feel so bad, I need, what do I, I need a cookie. You learn that. Great, you got good grades. Where do you go? Oh, she got great grades. He got great grades. Let's all go out to have dinner. Now, here's another one. Stress and childhood eating behaviors. Don't you leave that table till you finish everything on your plate. I had a man come to me. He said he would eat everything on his plate, and he wasn't even hungry, but he had to finish it. In hypnosis, but I mean, this is not like that, but in hypnosis, we come to find out He's a, I'm sorry, this is in your way. This is awful that's been in your way. But you know what? I can't change it. It's got to be in your way. Um, and hypnosis, come to find out, he was a Lutheran. Hey, well, I knew he was a Lutheran. It comes from a very strict household. And they had to eat everything on his place. And if he didn't, what was going to happen to the poor, starving children? He felt so guilty. He learned this. And it stayed with him to adulthood. You have a part in you that is always a child. It stays with you. Um, poor starving children, guilt. Don't eat now. That'll spoil your supper. You can't tell whether you're hungry or not after a while. Because you were told, you're not hungry. Don't eat. Don't eat. You were hungry. You should have had something to eat. You're getting fat. Don't eat so much, getting fat. People get older, they get very rebellious. Ah, uh, I'll, show, I'll show you I'm eating everything on that plate. Rebellious eater, rebellious. Um, so these are emotionally based attachments to food that we learn because many people don't develop more effective coping strategies. This is a type of emotional eating and it continues. Now, what I need here, this is called secondary gains. The subconscious mind is extremely protective. Remember we talked about the person who can't get on planes or the man that wouldn't go in the lake? Dun, 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 because of the uh, thinking that maybe there was still, I was going to say a dragon, but obviously I haven't seen a dragon on the lake, but I haven't seen a shark on the lake either. So. Um, so the subconscious mind is very protective, but it's not logical and it's not rational. So raise your hand if you were one of the people who salivated. Raise your hand for me, okay? Since you're close, why don't you come up here for one second? Let's come up here. And have a seat, and uh, who's the other person who salivated? You, come, come join us a second. Why don't you? Sit right here. I'm watching the clock. I gotta, I gotta be on time here. I'm gonna give that to you. I'm gonna put give that to you. And this is not, by the way, this is not a crystal ball. 
I, I like a lot of things about New Age, but I tend to work more on the scientific level, and I find that they have a meeting place. Um, what I want you to do first is just to watch me, and I'm going to give you this crystal ball. You're going to have the, uh, this little thing. I'm going to show them. It's just a circle. It says yes, up and down, because when I ask you a question and you don't respond verbally to me, you go like this, don't you? Right? So, if, uh, that's right. There you go. See? She learned that pretty quick, didn't she? Now, no. How do you shake your head for no? Side to side. Correct? All I want you to do is keep your arm, usually you have someone rest on a table, but you're going to keep your arm very loose. You're going to hold the very tip of this string. You're going to look, bring it down where it's almost touching the board or the paper. And you're going to go, you're not going to stop it from moving and you're not going to make it move. Only thing I ask you to do is stare at the ball and stare at the line. And so bring it all the way down and it almost touches. And we're going to ask our audience to help us out right here. Now all I want you to do is look at this line that goes up and down. And we're all going to say, up in a nice sing song. Up and down is yes. Up and down is yes. Very good. You have a wonderful, powerful mind. Very good. Again. Okay. Now, you, you nice long young lady, say it for me. Up and down is yes. Excellent. That's wonderful, powerful mind. Now, keep doing it. I'm just going to stop it, but continue to look at the ball. Continue to look at the ball. I'm going to stop it over here. Good. Keep looking at the ball, and I want you to look at this and go, side to side is no. Again. Side to side is no. Side to side is no. Just look at the line. And you repeat it with them. Side to side is no. That's fantastic. Side to side is no. Good. All right, stop. Now keep looking at the ball. Keep looking at the ball. Now, I don't want you to say anything to me. Just continue to look at the ball. I'm going to stop it. Just look at the ball. I'm going to ask you this question. Do you ladies now live in New Hampshire? Don't say anything. Do you now live in New Hampshire? Do you now live in New Hampshire? Do you now live in New Hampshire? That's wonderful. Of course you live in New Hampshire. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop that ball. Don't answer me. I'm going to stop. Just look at the ball and look at the line. Look at the ball and look at the line. Have you ever lived in China? Have you ever lived in China? Have you ever lived in China? Mm -mm. You've never <laughs> lived in China, have you? No. No, of course not. Look at that. No, of course not. <laughs> okay. Now, I'm going to stop the ball. I'm going to ask this question. Is there a part, is there a part of you, is there a part of you that doesn't want to lose weight? Any part. Is there a part of you that doesn't want to lose weight? Okay, so we have one yes and we have no. We're going to stop the ball. Is there a part of you that eats when you're angry? Is there a part of you that eats when you're angry? And it, and it changed, it reversed. Do you see? One does and the other doesn't. One wants uh, certain things. And this gets a little more complicated than, but there you go. Thank you so much and thank you for uh, dem adding to my demonstration. You do have powerful minds. Now all that was, was your subconscious mind. It's your brain. You have little, you have nerves. You have nerves. Uh, neurons in the brain, and I can't get into this now because we won't have enough time, but these neurons in the brain have um, axon, axons and dendrites, etc., parts of the brain, and they go all the way down to your arm. They go through every part of your body. So that's all that that is. Secondary gain. There's parts of you that you don't even know about, like the man who ate <laughs> because he was taught that, and it was still in his subconscious mind. Now, there are some people who are overweight. They say they want to lose weight, yet when you're big, believe it or not, for some people, that's power. 
you might not have had so much power when you were young. And for you, now I know how this sounds. Look how ridiculous it sounds. However, it's not conscious. When I went somewhere, when I first learned to be a, a hypnotherapist, and by the way, I'm going to tell you just how strong hypnosis. I originally learned hypnosis. When I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about the subconscious mind. But just to let you know, my father was an oral surgeon, and he would abstract people's teeth painlessly. I see patients, excuse me, clients, I don't like to call them patients, for uh, cancer, and they're able, through their mind, it's imagination, it's a commercial, that no longer get sick. They don't get sick from the chemotherapy. Some people would actually get sick from chemotherapy before they even got into the hospital because their minds were thinking about, worrying about it. Matter of fact, nurses, people shouldn't say, doctors shouldn't say, this is only gonna, this is just gonna be a little bit of pain. Wrong, wrong word, where will your imagination go when you hear the word pain? Yes, my father would say, if he gave somebody a needle or something, he would say, all you're gonna feel, feel is a little bit of pressure. Now that's what your mind is going to expect, is pressure. So anyway, there are some people who could be overweight because they want to have more power. I had a lady came to see me, she kept saying, everybody in the office is, you know, is noticed all the time. I want to be noticed. I want to be noticed. I want to be noticed. That's what she kept saying. What's going to make her feel, be more noticeable, to be overweight or to be a normal weight? She's going to get more attention being overweight. And she kept saying it. Your subconscious mind gives you what you want. So these are called secondary gains. Another thing is, like here's another one. A person's heart gets broken in a relationship. So to protect herself or himself from getting a heart broken again, the subconscious mind motivates the self to become fat to keep them out of relationships. So before you eat, use the word halt. Halt, stop, be aware, am I hungry or am I angry? Am I lonely or am I tired? You will eat when you're tired because your serotonin levels are down. When you fall asleep and you get plenty of sleep, you need sleep, you need a good night's sleep. If you don't have enough sleep, and this is on the slides, but we're going to go fast through them. If you don't have enough sleep, you will gain weight. If you are asleep, deprived, you gain weight. Sleep increases a hormone in your body called leptin, so that during the day you will feel more satisfied. If you don't get enough sleep, uh, and I'm going to forget how, it's G-H-E-L-I-N, girlin, and I may be pronouncing that incorrectly because I do have a tendency to speak uh, in languages, my own. <laughs> uh, it's, um, anyway, it's a type of uh, chemical in your body is produced in your stomach I believe it was your stomach and if you don't get enough sleep and you must notice this I bet people who don't get enough sleep you find you're hungrier during the day yeah and that's why if you get more sleep leptin will be produced and leptin will uh, help you with your cravings so back to serotonin uh, different things that will increase serotonin remember the thing that's in uh, depression um, Anti-anxiety pills, not anti-anxiety, but I'm rushing now because I'm looking at the clock. I want to be sure that we stop enough time to have uh, uh, some questions and answers going on here. But uh, serotonin is released for a short period of time after eating carbohydrates and enhances calmness. Well, here's something else that does. Sunlight. Sunlight in the eyes. Getting a 20-minute walk, getting sunlight in the eyes. You can get those sun lamps. Take your, take your desk. Put it by a window. Get rid of all the curtains. Let sunlight come in. It will raise your serotonin. Raise your serotonin. It lowers your cravings. Exercise. Exercise is fantastic. It increases your endorphins, and it definitely gets rid of cortisol because now you are running, or to some extent you're using up all that cortisol. Deep breathing. Deep breathing goes right into the parasympathetic nervous system, lowers serotonin, and ups. Uh, excuse me, up serotonin and it lowers cortisol. Self-hypnosis, which is nothing but guided imagery. It's the same thing. Experts agree that stress management is a critical part of weight loss. How at an ambulance or a fire siren, every chance you get, run around the room in circles with your socks in your mouth, eat a messy meal without using your hands or utensils and ask a friend to scratch your belly. Unfortunately, that's not one of the stress 
uh, management skills we could possibly use. Or well, maybe we could. Now, one of the ones that we can use is something called, um, called diaphragmatic breathing. So what I want you all to do, one hand on your chest, one hand on your belly. And this is a handout that you have. I want you all to take a very deep but easy breath in. As a matter of fact, I'm going to count to three and then we'll do it, okay? One, two, three. Deep breath. And exhale. And relax. One more time. A very deep, deep, easy breath like this. Take a deep breath. And then exhale. All right. Now, we're going to do it the third time, just relax, and I want you to notice what hand goes out first and which hand goes out furthest. The hand that's on your chest or the hand that's on your stomach. Are you ready? One, two, three. Inhale. Exhale. What hand went out first? Who here's uh, hand on the chest went out first? Raise your hand. Okay. Who here, their chest did not come up? Raise your hand. Good. How many did the belly come up? All right. Most of us in America are what we call thoracic breathing. Thoracic breathers tend to hold their breath and also tend to use nothing but their upper chest. When you use your upper chest and you breathe like this, your diaphragm goes up, your lungs get squished, and you are not allowing oxygen to get into your system. When you don't allow enough oxygen to get into your whole, all of your, the lung space of your body, you are now increasing, you're actually causing a slight stress response. So uh, you get lower oxygen, which promotes tension and muscle pain. Think of this. Think of like breathing like this all the time. You look like right here, right here in our shoe. What was that guy's name? Ed Sullivan. He must have been a thoracic breather because this is how he was all the time. Not good because when you come home, you're going to go like, oh my God, why does my neck hurt? Why does my shoulders so hurt so much? You're not breathing correctly. You're raising the stress response in your body. You're raising your heart rate, your blood pressure, and you're not promoting relaxation. And you're using muscles that don't need to be used for breathing. So this is how you want to breathe. You want to do diaphragmatic breathing. And I think I'm going to try to show you, and I was going to use this stool. I'm going to come over here like this. I'm going to get this. I don't know if I have a book. but You breathe with a chair, chair in your hair, <laughs> a chair in your hand all day. No. I'm going to put this here, and all I, uh, all I have is a, a case. You go home. You're watching TV. I would prefer if you listen to some nice music when you do it, but I know that people are always rushed. Great if you can listen to nice music. Take a book. Going to put a book on your belly. Now, first I'm going to show you the incorrect way. You ready? Incorrect. The book will just slide down. Your shoulders will come up. Your chest will come up. Correct way. Got that? When you're standing up, you can practice it. When you're home watching TV, practice it walking around the house. Take a little break. You take a little break. You put your hand on your chest, your hand on your belly. You take a deep but easy breath in. Hold it. Exhale slowly out your mouth and say, relax. We're going to do just about five more minutes and we're going to open this up for um, some questions. You will also find throughout the day you will probably be holding your breath. I notice myself that I hold my breath. I have to say, oh my God, I'm holding my breath. Take a deep breath. Relax. Inhale through the nose. Belly out, shoulders down, exhale out the mouth. 
Did I say inhale through the mouth? Inhale through the nose. Hold. Exhale. I say exhale through the mouth and make a sound because you want to make it like a, a balloon, you know, letting the air out of the balloon. This is called diaphragmatic breathing. It reverses the symptoms of stress, blood pressure, heart rate, muscle tension, it reduces cravings, and it also increases the blood flow, excuse me, the lymph flow in your body. So it enhances he healing and it massages your muscles, remove uh, waste products from the blood, releases calming chemicals, etc., 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 and it's on a handout. So this lady says, t Oh, the doctor says, I'm surprised no one noticed this before, but your weight gain appears to be the result of your eyes simply being bigger than your stomach. <laughs> so, I have just about three more minutes left. Ladies and gentlemen, tell me, how many people here see a uh, goblet? Raise your hand. Goblet. Do you see the goblet? I'm s what do you say? Either that or it's two people with something on their head. Exactly. There's either this, the goblet, uh -huh. or if you look at this, you will see the white is one face, and that's the other face. There's the nose, there's the lips, there's the chin. All right? That's how you're looking at it. How many people here see a young woman? Raise your hand. See a young woman? Yeah. Okay. How many people see the old woman? Kind of hard to see. All right. The uh, old woman, all I want you to do is look down here, and make believe that's teeth. That's a chin. That's her nose, and that's her eye. She's looking that way. I'll come back on that one. How many people see the old lady now? Okay, one more time. Teeth, chin, don't look at anything else. Just look at the chin and her teeth. And look at her big schnuzzle. See the big schnuzzle? Look at that. Hey. And her eye. With this, what I'm trying to get you to do is change your perception. Before you were able to see the goblet and the other time you saw two faces. Change your perception. So you want to change your eating? Change your perception when you see the food. When you see something you think you want, yell in your head stop because if you yell in your head stop right away you are changing the neural pathways in your brain right away matter of fact if you want take a rubber band click it out you need to disconnect pleasurable thoughts with the behaviors you no longer want to reinforce change that ice cream looks really great I'll have just a few bites to that ice cream is loaded fat and sugar I'd rather have a sweet healthy piece of fruit make these thoughts instead of saying I can't have that Say, I choose not to have that. Be in a place of power. You're not a victim. You have the power. Stay away from try. Oh, I'll try to lose weight. No, if you try, you're lost. Stay away from the word can't. I can't do this. I can do this. Stay away from the word don't. Okay. Because if I said right now, don't look. Don't look now. Here comes Bill. Exactly. <laughs> artificial sweetness. Artificial sweetness may actually promote weight gain by stimulating ap appetites and cravings by upsetting brain chemicals. Plus the sweet on your tongue. Uh, sweetness, you'll never think an apple or a fruit tastes sweet again because it upsets that. So anyway, the, I'm going to end this right now and we're going to open up for questions, but I'm going to tell you one of the worst things. These are all these things that causes weight gain. To me, the biggest one, poor boundaries. If you cannot say no to no others, if you cannot say no to others, you will never be able to say no to, your, no to food. If you cannot say no, if you do not have healthy boundaries, if you do for others and don't do for yourself, you will never be able to lose weight.